In this video, we are going to talk about Paladin, which is a bootable forensic Linux distro. We're going to be using it to acquire data from evidence from a target machine. Paladin comes in a few different flavors. There is Paladin LTS, Paladin Edge 32-bit, Paladin Edge 64-bit, and then the Paladin Pro USB. The software is available as donationware for non-commercial usage, and Samuri, the company that provided this tool asks for a minimum donation of 25 US dollars per user per year. And if you are using the software for commercial purposes, then that minimum donation is actually a required donation. And if you want to download the software, you can go ahead and visit the sumari.com website, much like we're looking at now. Let's take a look at Paladin LTS. Paladin LTS is based on the most current LTS version of Ubuntu. And then it contains a toolbox plus a ton of pre-compiled open source forensic tools. Anything ranging from uh, carving tools to database tools, hashing tools, internet analysis, log analysis, malware analysis, and so forth. And you can see from this graphic that it has a ton of stuff. And it also includes autopsy. Paladin Edge comes in two flavors, a 32-bit and 64-bit. And it only contains the toolbox, so the distro is smaller and boots much faster. And the toolbox is optimized for performing data acquisitions from imaging to logical copies. And down here we have Paladin Pro USB. This product is actually a physical USB that the company will give you, and it has all of the versions of Paladin preloaded on there. And it also has extra partitions created so you can store your Paladin logs or search criteria so you can prepare ahead of time and then bring it onto your search scene. For this video, I am primarily interested in data acquisition, so I'm going to be using Paladin Edge. I've already gone ahead and downloaded the ISO and created the bootable USB. If you're not familiar with how to build a bootable USB, check out this video here on how to do that. To boot Paladin on a PC, you can hold down the appropriate boot key on your computer. To boot Paladin on an Intel Mac, you can hold down the Alt Option key. Paladin is not supported on Apple Silicon Macs as far as I know, and Sumuri recommends that you use their product Recon ITR if you are going to be looking at acquiring from a Apple Silicon Mac. So once we've selected the Paladin boot device, the first thing we are going to see is the boot menu. Paladin boots in one of three modes, the forensic mode, the non-forensic mode, and then the Sumori remote services mode. The forensic mode is a forensically sound operating environment because media is not mounted and the networking is disabled. The mounting of devices is controlled by the Paladin toolbox with a disk manager tool. The non-forensic mode boots with all devices mounted and then the networking is enabled, much like a typical user machine. So when you are in your lab, you might want to run Paladin in this particular mode. And lastly, the Sumuri Remote Services mode will allow the control of the booted Paladin machine by Sumuri to assist you in imaging. All right, the options then repeat again for three modes, but with different options. First of which is Node Mode Set, which will be helpful if you are booting a machine and having screen resolution issues. And you may want to try one of these. Then you get the option for ACPI off, which will temporarily disable the advanced configuration and power interface. This will fix the issue of a black screen during and after booting if you have that issue. But this also means you won't be able to suspend the laptop when you close the lid or have the machine perform a soft shutdown. You will have to press and hold the power button in order to fully shut down the machine. So I'm going to go ahead and select the Paladin boot option for the forensic mode since I'm going to perform imaging off the booted machine. Once the machine is fully booted, you will notice the menu options on the bottom left. When you click on this icon, you will see the apps that you can run, ranging from the Paladin toolbox to Firefox to the VLC player. And this is basically the favorites menu. You can also click on the recently used or specific categories of tools that you want to use. On the top right of this menu, you will see the settings button, the lock screen button, and the power button. 
The settings button will allow you to make modifications to various settings ranging from screen resolution to network settings. The power button will allow you to reboot the machine, shut down, hibernate, etc. On the bottom left of the screen next to the app menu is the display app, which will allow you to adjust the resolution of the display. This could help if you are on a machine which has very high resolution screen, which makes the font really, really small. So I've booted this on one of the nicer Intel Macs and I couldn't read the fonts, they're way too small. So I like to adjust this to bump up the word sizes to something that I can actually read without squinting. All right, then we have the Paladin dock on the bottom. Starting from the left, the icons are for the toolbox, the quick start guide, the remote services menu, Firefox, terminal, screen capture, LibreOffice, and then the Mountain Media. So these are all the more common things that we use. And you can access any of these tools by a single click on the icon. All right, let's click on the main icon that we're gonna look at today, the toolbox. After the app is fully loaded, I get a warning panel alerting me to the fact that the dates and times displayed by Paladin are based on the host system date and time. If you're booting to an evidence computer, you wanna make sure that you record the display time and date and how that compares to a standardized time like your department issued cell phone or the US Naval Observatory at time.gov. To change the system time, click on the icons on the bottom right to select the time zone and whether you want to manually change the date and time or have it synced to an internet time server. Next, let's take a look at where Paladin will write out the logs. You can select the location by clicking on the icon on the top left and then use the drop down to select the drive you want to write to. Note that your staging or output drive may not be listed here as you probably haven't mounted it yet. And we'll get to that in the section for mounting and unmounting drives. Let's take a look at all of the tools available on the left hand column. It starts with Imager, which will image from a selected source. And then you have the option to write out the image to two different locations and two different formats ranging from cloning, a DD or raw output, the E01, the EX01, the S01, DMG format, a VMDK file, or a VHD file. You also have the option to verify each image after creation and then specify the segment size. All right, so let's go ahead and image our subject drive in this case. And I'm going to go ahead and select that as my source. For the image type, I'm going to select E01, the expert witness format. In the next panel, it will ask you for case information. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my case number. I'm going to go ahead and put in my evidence number. The examiner's name. A unique description. And then it will ask you for the compression. Uh, and you have the option of none, fast, or best. For this demo, I'm gonna go ahead and select fast. All right, so for destination, it's gonna ask you where you wanna put it. Once again, I'm gonna select my eight gig staging drive. And then for the label, I'm gonna use the evidence number to keep it unique. And then I'm gonna check the box that says verify after creation, as it is best practice to make sure your staging drive didn't go bad and that you have a valid image. For segment size, I'm gonna select that and then leave it as the default of 2000 megabytes as that is the old traditional standard. And as for this demo, I'm going to check additional imager to show you that Paladin has the capability to write out two different images at the same time to two different destinations. So for the second image type, I'm gonna select VMDK and then for the destination, I'm going to select the network share named server share. Look in the part of this video that talks about network share to see how I set this up. Once again, for label, I will use the unique evidence number. And when we are ready, I am going to hit the start button. So we see two progress bars as we have two different processes running. You can also click the tabs named imager one and imager two to see the output of each one of those two processes. 
The image one tab shows the status from the E01 creation process and it's giving us the amount acquired and the estimate time to completion. So it's progressing pretty good. Let's click on imager two tab and it also shows the status, but it's a little slower. So I guess writing out to either the network or the VMDK takes a little longer time. Now we see that one of the status bars have disappeared as the first imaging process is done and it goes to the verification process. And you can see it's verifying. And once the verification process is done, the log panel pops up and shows us the command used for imaging, times and hashes and all that kind of stuff. So now it's done. The next tool is the image converter which will read in an image and then write out into any of the other formats that it understands. So this could be useful if your analysis tool only reads in a certain format or if you want to save disk space when you're saving a compressed image. So I'm going to go ahead and select the E01 that I just created and then I want to convert it to let's say a EX01 format. And of course, I'm going to check the verify option because we always want to make sure hashes match when we move or convert or examine an image set. The next tool is the find tool, which will perform a keyword search within specified files or search for specified file names or search for MIME categories, MIME lists, etc. This is actually a big topic all by itself. So I'm going to save this for another video later. The next tool is the unallocated space imaging. This tool will image only the unallocated or, or unpartitioned space as a raw image file that you can later carve for data. I'm going to go ahead and choose this 4 gig USB and then grab the unallocated space from the device. So it comes back pretty quickly as the single partition we have pretty much used up the entire space on that device. So there isn't really much unpartitioned space. So let's go ahead and select a NTFS partition on one of my Windows drives and see if we get something more interesting. Ah, here we go. So this comes up with much more data in the unallocated space. And as you can see, it's definitely finding a lot of unallocated space on this drive. And so I'm going to go ahead and abort this as I will run out of space on my staging drive. But you get the idea that there is much more data in an unallocated space on my Windows partition than that one drive that only has one partition. Next is the disk manager, which will show you all the devices that is visible to Paladin. This includes media that is internal to the machine as well as media that is attached externally. For each device, you will get the make model of that device and then a breakdown of the partition table. So each partition is shown with the file system the label if it exists, the size, the mount path if mounted, and the access modes such as read only or read write. Let's look at the buttons here above the log and status section. The first button is refresh. So you can press this when you add a new device to the machine. But this should basically automatically be done. As you see here, I just inserted a new USB thumb drive to the system and it shows up as uh, slash dev slash SDC. Next is the mount dash R button, which means mounting a partition read only. So we can select the partition that we want to mount and then press mount R. A few things happen when I press that button. First, a file manager window popped up to show us the contents of that partition. So we know that it was successfully mounted. Note that all of the files have this lock icon on it, which indicates that the volume is read only. And then if we look back at the Paladin toolbox, the system has added a path in the mount path column, and then the words read only in the mode column. The mount path is usually slash media followed by the volume label of the partition, if there is one. Otherwise, it will use the volume UUID. And the last thing that happened when we press the mount R button is that a line popped up in the task log panel telling us that a certain partition with model and serial number has been mounted. Let's look at the mount dash RW button, which mounts a partition read write. We can select that partition and press the mount RW button. 
Once again, we see the file manager window pop up showing us that it was successfully mounted and we no longer see those lock icons on the files, which means we can modify or delete files in this volume. And as noted in the mode column, the status now says read-write. And another thing to note is that it is in red versus green for the read only. So red means warning, right? Careful. The next button is verify. What you can do here is select either a disk or an unmounted partition. And you want to make sure that the partitions are unmounted. Otherwise, this will not work. When you press the verify button, the tool will calculate a MD5 and a SHA-1 hash of that disk or partition. You can use this tool when you receive a piece of evidence and you want to make sure that the data hasn't changed in transit to you. Next is the format button. This will allow you to format a selected disk or partition. Your options are to give it an optional volume label and then select which file system you want to format the disk or partition to. Your choices are ext4, ntfs, vfat, hfs plus, and xfat. I suggest that if you are going to use this feature, you are not booting Paladin on a subject machine, but rather back in your lab on your own forensic workstation because you don't want to format the evidence by mistake. The advice also goes for the last button here, the wipe button. Make sure you are selecting the device you want to wipe by checking the make, model, the size, the label, you know, double check everything. I would suggest you remove all other devices if possible so you don't wipe the wrong thing. Once you're sure you have the correct device selected, the tool will ask you to be sure. Then it will ask you if you want to verify your wipe. Essentially, this will double your time to wipe and then read back the same device. But I usually do this at the end of the day before I go home anyways, so why not? And notice this is logged in the task logs tab at the bottom and also in the wipe tab. And once again, I highly recommend that you perform wiping and formatting on your own forensic workstation and not on the evidence machine. The last tool on the left sidebar is the network share. When you click on this, you will see two tabs, one for the Windows style Samba share and the second tab for the Unix style NFS share. You can mount up either or both of these shares to write out the images. I have used this feature in the lab where our images are all stored up on a server which is accessible via SMB. And then out in the field, I have set up a NAS on a local network so that a few examiners can all write their images up to one central file server. Now let's click on the mount option within the Samba tab. You will see a pop-up panel, which is asking for a host IP. I'm going to enter 192.168.1.20, which is my server's IP. Then I'm going to type in the username and password for the account to log into. Uh, you can type in a domain if you have multiple domains on the same network. I don't, so I'm going to leave it blank. And then the name of the file share, which is server-share. And then lastly, whether you want to mount the share as read-only, and I'm going to say no, as I want to be able to write my images to the file share. So as you can see here, the file share is mounted. Now let's click over to the NFS tab and then click on the mount option. The pop-up is simpler as it only needs a host IP and then the share's name. So for the host, I'm going to put in the IP of 192.168.1.20 and then for the share folder, I'm going to use the path of slash home slash live user slash server dash NFS, which is how it's set up. And once you commit to all of that, you get the feedback here that the file share is mounted. So now we got one of each type mounted that we can use. Paladin is a great tool to use if you want to boot up an evidence machine instead of taking it apart and trying to get the hard drives out. You boot up in a forensic environment, the graphical user interface is straightforward, and the tools are very helpful in acquiring data. For more information on another Linux forensic distro named Kane, watch these videos here. Make sure you click on the blue monkey to subscribe. Thanks for your time and happy hunting.